Good morning. Welcome to the Rock Church. My name is Josh Whitney. I'm one of the pastors. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark. If you brought your Bible, open it to Mark chapter 7. We're going to study Mark today. We're going to study Mark next weekend. And then like Mary said, we're going to take a six-week break for our new series we entitled The Great Adventure. It's all about marriage and parenting and family. And then after that series, we're going to go back into the Gospel of Mark. So I'm looking forward to this series. I'm looking forward to getting back into the Gospel of Mark. And I'm looking forward to studying Mark chapter 7 with all of you this morning. This is part 17 of our series. We're in Mark 7 again verses 1 through 13, I titled this message, People's Opinion or God's Word. Just a little power review. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel, the most concise, very action-packed. Mark tends to focus more on what Jesus is doing instead of what he is teaching. There's exceptions to this, chapter 4, chapter 7, but Mark has all this action, all this stuff that Jesus is doing. So it's interesting the parts that Jesus taught that he chooses to include. And since earlier in the book, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, have been plotting to destroy Jesus. So here in chapter 7, we have another fight between Jesus and the religious leaders over what makes you unclean. We're going to start talking about hand washing, and then later in the chapter, it moves into what you eat. But this section is ultimately a question of authority. Is it my opinion? Is it your opinion? Or is it God's word? So right now, Jesus is in the region of Capernaum. He just fed 5,000 people, and then he walked on water, which Caleb covered last week. And we are two years into Jesus' public ministry. We have about one year until his death and resurrection. So we're in Mark chapter 7. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. The verses are on your handout as well. I'm going to pray, and we're going to get into it. God, I thank you for a chance, like Steele said, just to kind of wake our hearts up and worship you. God, I thank you for this beautiful morning you gave us. I thank you, God, that you allowed us all to get here safely, Lord. I do thank you that we have the freedom to gather as your sons and daughters and study your holy word. God, I pray right now that you would use me, I'd be your vessel, that you would take your spirit and your word and you would speak to every man, woman, and child in this room in a personal way. We say all this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we are in Mark chapter 7, verse 1. And it looks like we have lost, so grab your handouts or your Bible. So Mark chapter 7, verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, to Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, and they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed, so it's about 90 miles from Jerusalem to Capernaum. You know you have a bee in your bonnet if you're willing to walk 90 miles to correct grown men about how they wash their hands. The Pharisees, they're the, the religious, hardcore conservatives. They memorize large chunks of the Old Testament. They want their fellow Jews to be serious about actually obeying the law of God, which would appear good on the surface, but we're going to get into it. The scribes are the Old Testament Bible scholars. They're the experts in the law. So maybe the religious big shots have rolled into town from Jerusalem. This is kind of like the official leadership delegation from Jerusalem. Maybe they were requested, come down here. You guys got to check out this Jesus guy. And what is this hand washing? Is this all about hygiene? What kind of hand washing are we talking about? So the author, Mark, he adds this footnote in verses 3 and 4 explaining to his audience that's reading his book. He wrote his book to a non-Jewish audience, so he sticks this footnote in here. Verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. That's a big sink if you're going to wash your couch in that sink. You might be wondering, what does hand washing have to do with us today? Actually, a lot as we get into it. And you'll notice there in verse 3, it says all of the Jews. So the religious leaders have convinced all of their people, this hand washing, this is a really big deal. 
And this isn't your mom like, oh, make sure you wash your hands before you eat dinner. This is about a ceremonial washing to remove uncleanness. I read different sources that said there's a certain pitcher you use. And you have to hold, you fill it in your left hand, and then you transfer it to your right hand, and then you hold your left hand like this, and you pour it twice from the wrist down, and you want to make sure you get every part of your hand, and then you switch hands, and you do it again this way. And then when you're drying your hands, there's a certain prayer or benediction that you say. Did you know that there are Orthodox Jews today that still practice ceremonial hand washing? There are fascinating videos on YouTube where rabbis are teaching the proper way to wash your hand. Again, use a certain pitcher with two handles, hold your hand, pour a certain number of times, make sure you say this blessing. It's all about making yourself holy. It's all about making yourself pure. The rabbis taught this is one of the ways that you make yourself right with God. They had rules. When you go to the market or when you go to the grocery store, you might, you might bump into somebody who's not a Jew, a Gentile, so you need to go home and take a bath to cleanse your body. And again, the Pharisees are not nagging Jesus and his followers. You guys have like really dirty hands. You need to wash them. That's so gross. No, this is about following religious rules. And this is in the context of this intensifying conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. They're taking Jesus to task because he's not following their cleanliness rules, these rules that they think make them more holy. Now, what is the origin of this hand washing? In the Old Testament, there were laws that said the high priest had to wash their hands when they were in the Holy of Holies before they ate the holy bread. It was a requirement for the priest. It became a strong suggestion for all the people. So by the time Jesus is on this scene, it was a common practice for the Jews. I read one dramatic illustration of this. There was a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi that was in prison, and he was given an limited ration of water and food. He took his limited water and he poured it on his hands to wash his hands. He said, I would rather die of thirst than have unclean hands. So again, this is not about hygiene. This is about a ceremonial washing to remove uncleanness, impurities, to make yourself more holy, or so they thought. Let's pick it up in verse 5. You can read on your hand out there or in your Bible. And the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Notice that phrase there, the tradition of the elders. The word tradition actually occurs six times in this short passage. It's all about following traditions, people's opinions. The word tradition is from the Greek word paradosis, para meaning beside, dosis meaning to hand over, to hand over something to someone who is close beside you. It's a tradition. And hand washing was so serious in this culture that they, there are writings that say if you did not wash your hands the right way, you could be excommunicated from the Sanhedrin. This is a big deal. They're like, Jesus, why are you and your followers not following our religious rules for ceremonial hand washing? This is what we do, Jesus. Why aren't you doing it? I read a great quote by E. Stanley Jones, a missionary and evangelist. He said this, speaking of the Pharisees. He said, they came all the way from Jerusalem to meet Jesus. Their life attitudes, though, were so negative and so fault-finding that all they saw were unwashed hands. They couldn't see the greatest movement of redemption that has ever touched our planet, a movement that was about cleansing the minds and the souls and the bodies of men. They missed it. This isn't a joke to the Pharisees. These are their religious rules. This is how you make yourself right with God. The Pharisees are trying to obey God, which is a good thing. They're they're trying to get the people to take obeying God's law seriously, but they have completely missed the boat. That's your first fill in the blank on your handout. I will just tell you, even the most Christian of people can miss the point. Even the most Christian of people can miss the point. That should sober us. Even the most holy of people can be dead wrong. The most churchy people, the people that know the scriptures the best, the people that claim to know God, the most religious, us. We could totally miss the point. 
And that should give all of us pause if we're honest with ourselves this morning. So how does Jesus respond to the most powerful religious leaders of his day? Imagine meeting with someone who is famous or powerful, a celebrity, a religious leader. Imagine if the Pope showed up and the Pope was like, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this or that religious thing? Would we be diplomatic? Would we hem or a ha? Would we look for common ground? Notice how Jesus responds to the most powerful religious leaders of his day who have traveled 90 miles from the capital to question him. Verse 6, And Jesus said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. No, Jesus, you don't need to sugarcoat it. No, tell us what you really think. <laughs> Jesus lights into them. He calls them hypocrites. He says their worship is vain. Vain means it's pointless. It's fruitless. It has, it has no purpose. So notice also that when Jesus gets challenged with his action, he goes directly to the Bible. He doesn't go to tradition. Here he's quoting from Isaiah 29, verse 13. And you know what struck me about Jesus? He is so much more hardcore than us. There's times he's so direct, so challenging, so confrontational. I think of this interaction right here. And there are other times that Jesus is so much more kind than us. He's so loving. He's so merciful. He's so tender. I think of the time that Jesus touched the man with leprosy and healed him. So if you only picture Jesus as like this tender, merciful shepherd, or if you only picture Jesus as this bold, confrontational, radical, then your picture of Jesus is incomplete. He's both. Jesus is nicer and more loving and more kind than us, and he is more radical and direct and confrontational than us. He's the perfect mix of these two. Jesus knew exactly what was needed in the moment well, here in chapter 7, obviously, he's on the hardcore end. He's calling the holiest people in his country hypocrites. Let's skip forward about eight slides. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding. All right. He calls the most religious people in his entire nation fakes. That's what the word hypocrite means, an actor, someone who wears a mask, someone who is pretending to be someone they are not. We only see people on the outside externally, and that's what makes people pretenders or actors or hypocrites, is that what is going on internally, in private, in the heart, doesn't match what is happening externally, what is done publicly. In the NLT, Jesus said it this way. He said, their worship of me is a farce, a joke. God sees what is going on on the inside, he goes, oh, they're singing about loving me, but I see what is going on on the inside. Their worship of me is a farce. It's a joke. Hypocrites. Act like they love God externally, but our hearts don't match up. Charles Spurgeon, the preacher, speaking of hypocrites, put it this way. Of all the things in the world that stink in the nostrils of men, hypocrisy is the worst. So the religious person that rails against sexual sin but then goes home and watches pornography is a hypocrite. The Christian who claims to love Jesus and then jumps on their phone and gossips with their friend, a hypocrite. The, person who, the parents who tell their kids, oh, we don't watch those shows, we're Christians, and then the kids go to bed and then the parents watch whatever they want. In fact, things they'd be embarrassed of if the kids walked in. Or the pastor who gets up and preaches a sermon on anger and self-control, and then he goes home and he gets frustrated with his kids and he's angry with them. I'm talking about me, I'm a hypocrite too. It's the person who goes, oh, I would never smoke. I want to take care of my body, but then they just don't take care of their body. It's the Christian who divorces their spouse with any, without any biblical grounds. It's the teenager who's nice to their friends at school and then they come home and they're mean and moody with their parents, a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. 
I hope you see that this morning. That's the bad news. We'll get into the good news in a little bit. But how do hypocrites rationalize or justify our hypocrisy? Look at verse 8. Jesus shows us how people arrive at this place of hypocrisy. He said, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. There's our word tradition again. So Jesus is contrasting people's opinion with God's word. Specifically in this verse, in this section, he's talking about the man-made Jewish laws. So what do I mean? Here's a picture of some Ten Commandments from some church somewhere. Look at number third one down there, the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor the Sabbath. So what does that mean? So for centuries, Jewish leaders and teachers had been interpreting and explaining what does honor the Sabbath mean. And literally, volumes of books were written explaining and codifying what does it mean to honor the Sabbath or keep the Sabbath. Well, remember, God made the Sabbath as a day of rest. It's a day to take a break from your normal work. But the Jewish oral tradition, which became their written laws, they've developed all these rules and regulations about what you can and cannot do on a Saturday or a Sabbath. Like, don't plant, don't plow, don't reap, don't cook, don't shear, don't spin, don't trap, don't smooth, don't cut, don't write, don't erase, don't build, don't demolish, don't ignite. I read one rule that said, don't look in a mirror, because if you look in a mirror, you might see, oh, I've got a random stray hair there. You might be tempted to pluck it, and you will have done work on a Saturday. I read my Bible. I read it many times. Nowhere does it say, don't pluck your hairs on Saturdays. (laughs) I Googled it. It's not in the Bible. That's just a man-made rule. Again, verse 8, you... Leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. So these religious teachers are encouraging their people, you don't need to worry about what the Bible says. Specifically, we've got volumes of books to explain to you what God meant practically, actually. So the Jewish law started out as an oral tradition, and then it became this. This is a collection of the Mishnah. That's the oral tradition of the Jewish law, which forms the first half of the Talmud. And then the Gemara, or the Gemara, the rabbinical commentary on the Mishnah, that's the second part of the Talmud. So there's 30 chapters there on how to wash your dishes the right way. There's a whole book there, one whole book written on the proper method to wash your hands. And the Jews, they read the first five books of our Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Torah. That has become that. But before we judge them, we have more books. Our bookstores are bigger. There are no limit to the number of Christian books and bookstores and websites and apps and blogs all about what God actually meant to say. You don't need to read that. You just need to read. We'll tell you what God meant to say right here. Before we go read a book the Bible on parenting. Does anybody have a good parenting book I could read? Or worse, we jump on social media. Anybody got any parenting tips for me right now? Or we're in a bad spot in our marriage and we go, I wonder if there's a good Christian blog on marriage instead of going to the book. And so the question for us is, do we have opinions that we are elevating above God's Word? Do we have opinions that we are elevating above God's word? Absolutely, we do. Later in this chapter, Jesus is going to declare all foods clean, but we have people's opinions. Yeah, 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 Jesus said all food is clean, but we know there's certain foods you eat if you're better than people. Or what about Ephesians 5? It says to Christians, among you there must not be a hint of sexual immorality. But then what are people's opinions? Well, you gotta, you got to have sex before you get married to see if you're sexually compatible. Or you got to live together to see if you're marriage compatible. Or, you know what, we can do whatever we want sexually. We're two consenting adults. Those are human opinions, human traditions I've heard many times. Or Ephesians chapter 5 also says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, though, we have people's opinions. Oh, you're not drunk if you can, like, still stand and talk. You don't have a drinking problem, never mind the fact you go home every day after work and you go in your closet of alcohol and you drink every night. Dude, it was no big deal. It was just a party. We're just having some friends. We're just celebrating, bro. Relax. You were drunk, bro. Everybody saw it. 
Or what did Jesus say in Matthew 5? He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. But people's opinions are like, dude, that's a small lie. That's a white lie. Everybody breaks that rule. Everybody exaggerates. Nobody does that on their time record. Oh, everybody just skips that part of the school assignment. Yes, I guess technically that's not a lie, Dad. (laughs) or spouse. It goes on and on. We take human tradition, human opinion, some man-made oral rule, and we elevate it above the Bible. Or put another way, are you a sidestepper? Are you a skillful sidestepper? Any of you country dancers? You like, you know, like the two-step shuffle? I don't like that verse. How can I get around it? How can I sidestep it? How can I ignore it? How can I justify my disobedience of God's Word on this or that topic? Or maybe you think, People might have believed that verse in the past, but this is 2019. We need a good workaround on that verse now. Jesus continues, verse 9, Jesus said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Jesus actually is saying the same thing in verse 8, verse 9, and verse 13. Anytime Jesus says something three times, we should like perk up our ears You are rejecting God's word to establish your own tradition. Another translation says it this way. Jesus continued, you have a clever way of rejecting God's law. That's sarcasm. Jesus is being sarcastic right now. I love that. He's like, you're so clever. Good for you. (laughs) You have a good way of working around the word of God But you guys know this is us. This is our society. We live in a society that is constantly establishing new traditions that are in direct disagreement with God's Word. We live in a culture that is establishing new traditions right before our eyes on marriage, sexuality, and gender. God says very clearly in His Word that marriage is a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman, and all sexual expression should happen within that marriage. But now a person is lauded as a hero if they break their marriage vows to go fulfill their repressed sexual identity. What would Jesus say? He'd be like, you have a clever way of working around the Word of God to establish your own tradition. We say stuff like, well, my needs aren't being met in this marriage, or this isn't the person I thought I was marrying, or this is not what I thought marriage would be like. We get so immersed in this culture. I read a news story about a dad leaving his mom, and the kid said something like, I'm just glad the dad is free to pursue his new partner and his new identity. Jesus said, though, in Mark 10, what God has joined together, let man not separate It's a selfish decision that dad and mom are making in direct violation of God's word, but at least they're happy. That's our new tradition. Or we live in a society that says don't discuss religion, don't tell people about Jesus, don't ask them what they believe. Somebody tells you something hard in their life, don't tell them you'll pray for them. You keep your religion to yourself. But God's word said how blessed are those who bring good news. Or we live in a society that thinks the Bible is a myth, it's a poem, it's a legend, it's all made up. Don't take it literally. I had a coworker years ago say, you don't like literally, literally believe the Bible is true, do you? Now, of course, the Bible says the opposite, that it's the Word of God, it's true, it's accurate. Every pen stroke, Jesus said, that God actually created the world, He flooded the world, miracles actually happen, and that God is returning to reign and rule. We are establishing new traditions right now related to what is and is not sexual sin, what, how to act on social media, how to use your phone, your phone. We're establishing all of these traditions, traditions related to killing the unborn. You know, it's not just something out there, church. It's right here in the church. Human traditions get elevated above God's Word. I, I read a story that powerfully illustrated a story of a missionary family that was forced out of the mission field because of peanut butter. Let me tell you the story. So there was a missionary family that loved peanut butter. They went out on their mission to their mission location. They got there. They discovered there was no peanut butter available. They had a choice. They could go without peanut butter. They could ask their friends and family back in the United States to send them peanut butter. They prayed about it, and what they decided to do was like, we're going to give up peanut butter for Jesus. We have the right to peanut butter, but we're going to forego this small thing kind of as a sacrifice to the Lord. It's commendable. But then a second missionary family rolled into the same location, also loved the peanut butter, 
And they said, hey, friends and family, can you send us some peanut butter? So you see what's going to happen here. There's a problem. The first family considers it a godly sacrifice to give up peanut butter. The second family goes, this is a matter of personal conviction. And so the pressure became so intense between these two families that the second family gave up and left the mission field. What happened here? They were elevating people's opinion above God's word. The first family started down this road with pretty good rationale, but the problem started when they took their opinion and they elevated it above God's word and then they forced it on other people. We do this with so many things, church. We do this with educational methods, teaching styles in church, worship styles. I like it quieter, I like it louder, I like it more acoustic, I like drums. This is what Jesus would be doing politically. This is who Jesus would vote for. Christians would never watch that. They would always watch this. They would dress a certain way. And you know, we have people in both ends of the spectrum in this room. There's like the hardcore people in the room, and there's the people with low standards. And all of us wrestle with, though, both groups wrestle with, am I elevating human opinion above God's word? If you're hardcore, are you creating standards that aren't in the Bible? Like missionaries don't eat peanut butter. If you have low standards, are you ignoring things that God says clearly in his word? Like, you know, Christians can watch movies full of sex scenes. That's no big deal. So the question is, do you wrestle more with improperly elevating human tradition or ignoring God's commands? We're all bent one way or the other. Either we tend to make the optional, people's opinions, mandatory, or we're the people that make God's word, which should be mandatory, optional. Which are you? Are you the legalist or are you the licentious? Now, why do we do this? Why do we keep disobeying God's commands? How come we're elevating things that aren't in the Bible? I think it's because we don't know the word of God. I think we're not in the word of God. It's not our daily bread. We're not reading it day to day. I thought this quote by the pastor S. Lewis Johnson was good. He said, I've come to believe that the great sin of Christians is neglect of the Bible. Our greatest failure is that we don't read the Bible. We listen to people talk about the Bible. We listen to preachers and we read books, but we do not read the Bible. Of course you're toast when you're pushed on a certain subject. If you don't know the Word of God, if you don't know what God actually says about something, is this this just my opinion? Is this optional? Or is this the Word of God? Is this mandatory? So the question would be for us this morning, is there a topic you need to study God's Word more deeply on? What's the subject that you need to like dig into God's Word and read and study and really get a good handle on it instead of just listening to your friends or social media or that podcast? So now here in verse 10, Jesus is going to share an example of what he's actually talking about, like a real example of how their opinions are canceling out the Word of God. Jesus continues, verse 10, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. He's quoting from Exodus 20. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die, Exodus 21. Again, struck by the fact that Jesus quotes the Old Testament three times in this short section. I've heard people be like, oh, Jesus didn't care about the Old Testament. That's categorically untrue. He's attacked in this moment. He responds with three different citations of the Old Testament. And I am sure, for the record, the Pharisees would have been like, oh, absolutely honor your parents. Totally agree, 100%. It's one of the big ten. But now look how they work around it. Verse 11, Jesus is going to quote from their man-made tradition. But you say, honor your parents, but you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that's given to God, that's a sacrifice, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, and thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. Honor your father and mother, respect them, listen to them, obey them, especially when you're younger. And as your parents get older, part of honoring them might be actually caring for them physically, financially. But these religious leaders, they've developed a loophole. It's the Corbin loophole. Mom, Dad, I would have given you this money. I have the money. You need the money. But I gave it to the Lord. (laughs) It's Corbin. It's interesting. The money did not have to be given to God in that moment. It was like a future commitment, like I'm earmarking these funds for Jesus someday. 
Mom, you need some food money? I gave it to Jesus in the future. It's noted in my book. My hands are tied. It's a remarkable loophole. A guy's basically like, sorry, Dad, can't help you. I gave it to Jesus, but it's still in my bank account. (laughs) He could keep it indefinitely. He could use it for business. He might never actually give it to the priest, but it's Corbin. And then that phrase there at the end, Jesus says, and many such things you do. This was a common practice. They're really good at developing loopholes. What looks like pious fulfillment of the law is actually avoiding fulfilling God's law. That guy dedicated all of his money to Jesus? Wow, he's so godly. No, actually, he's just shirking out on taking care of his mom. (laughs) So where are you making loopholes to disobey God? Like, what's your workaround? How do you ignore that verse that God is bringing to mind right now? How do you justify your disobedience? What's your loophole? Your sidestep? As we bring this to a close, remember this whole heated exchange started over hand washing. The religious leaders thought that holiness, right standing with God, could be attained by washing your hands and hundreds of other rules. So what is your application if you have joined us this morning and you are not a Christian? You're not a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. How do people try to cleanse themselves, how to make themselves right with God? Inside many churches, people are told, well, you get to heaven, you climb that ladder. Well, you got to get baptized. You got to get married the right way. You got to do the proper good works. You got to go to church. You got to give money. You got to take sacrament. You got to read your scriptures. You got to volunteer. Those are all good things. We should probably do them for sure. But people are told if you follow those rules, you're earning your standing with God. Probably the oldest tradition of men is that you earn your position, your standing with God by what you do. And that is simply not true. I could send you a dozen verses if you want to email me, but I'll just show you one here. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's the good news, that Jesus saved hypocrites like us, broken people like us, sinners like us, that he freely gives us salvation by his mercy, by Christ's death on the cross for our sins. That's what hand washing or any religious good work is all about, is we sense, oh, I'm broken. I'm sinful. I'm a hypocrite. I better do these things. I better wash my hands to make sure I'm earning my holiness. I don't know about you, but if you and I need to wash our hands the right way the rest of our life to earn standing with God to get to heaven, we're hosed. (laughs) We're not going to do it right all the time. We're going to mess up. You should read the Word of God. You should see God's righteous standards. It should alarm you. You should go, I'll never be able to do that. And then God says, you don't need to. I did it. And then we reach out to God with the empty hand of faith, and He saves us. That's the good news. If you are not a born-again Christian, talk to me, talk to one of the pastors, go to the Connections booth, get right with the Lord this morning. And what is our application for the rest of us? Go, yeah, I am a Christian. I'm a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Where are we disobeying God's word for tradition's sake? Tradition is fine as long as it doesn't conflict with the word of God, but we have new traditions being established in our culture on like a daily basis And that's why we have to be in the Word of God so we can constantly be assessing what we hear in media and friends and social media and movies and conversations. What's being preached at me right now? Is this opinion biblical or unbiblical? Some of you are like, well, I just don't know what the Bible says about certain topics. What might Jesus say to you? In Mark chapter 12, Jesus said, how wrong you are. And do you know why? It is because you don't know the Scriptures. Are you ignorant about what God's Word actually says on certain subjects? And maybe that's why you are elevating people's opinions above the Word of God. Others of you are thinking, oh, I know exactly what the Bible says on this or that topic. But I've rejected it. I've developed a workaround, a loophole. What might Jesus say to you? The second verse, our key verse this morning, Mark 7, 9. You have a clever way 
of rejecting God's law in order to uphold your own teaching. Remember, Jesus said this to the most religious, scripture-memorizing, preachy Bible people of his day. Three times he says, you're rejecting the Word of God, you're upholding your own tradition. I think every one of us is either on the upper end or the lower end. We're either ignorant of what God's Word says, or we are cleverly rejecting it. And so our final fill-in-the-blank is your greater personal danger, ignorance of God's Word, or cleverly rejecting it. And men and women, if you value people's opinion, culture's opinion over the Word of God, there is a great danger that you will shipwreck your faith before you're done. May God give us the grace to know His Word and obey it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this, this, uh, I thank you for this interaction that Mark recorded here in Mark chapter 7. Lord, I thank you that you want to teach us. You want to teach us the importance of being people of your book, that it is not something I read on Instagram. It's not something I heard on the radio. It's not something my coworker told me. It's what does it say in your word? God, I know there are men and women in this room that do not read your word consistently. I pray that you would ignite in their heart a hunger for your word, that they would read it and learn it and study it and obey it. And God, many of us, we have grown callous to your word, and we just have workarounds and sidesteps and clever loopholes to not obey very clear teachings. God, convict us where we need to be convicted. And God, there are, there are people here that have not accepted you as their Lord and Savior. They're on that ladder. They're trying to climb their way to heaven. God, help us to realize it is just your mercy. It's your grace. Help them to reach out to you with the empty hand of faith. We say all this in Jesus' name. Amen.